Our first speaker um, is uh, Chef jo Jonna Gale, who is uh, the, also known as the kitch Kitchen Shaman, founder and executive chef and CEO of uh, Kitchen Shaman uh, LLC. Uh, Jonna has spent over 20 years working in professional kitchens in Arizona, New Mexico, and even the brief stint in Kansas. She has uh, a website and brings, uh, so you can look her up after this uh, talk today if you're interested, she brings a lifelong passion for food and the joys of cooking to her career as a cooking instructor, coach, and food writer. John, it's great to have you here. Hi everyone, thanks for coming out in the cold, wow. <laughs> It's really cool for Arizona. Hi, welcome to the Arizona Vegetarian Food Festival. And um, I'm kicking it off with a talk on the history and uses of spices. And I think I, I started writing about the history of food because I had a chef who kept coming up to me going, do you know what this is? Um, yeah. Do you know where it's from? No. Okay, cool, let's, let's find out about this. So it all started with the potato. Seriously, where are potatoes from? And it developed from there, and so my curiosity started getting me, and I started writing this food blog, and I started writing recipes, and I had to have topics to write about. And I started looking about what other people were writing about, and I'm like, well, people aren't really writing about the history of food, so let's get into that. Now, there's a couple of books out there on the history of spices that you can find, and they're like this thick, and you know, you have to have like uh, lots of language, understanding of language, understanding of history, and an understanding of how, how the discovery years work. So let's go back to, we're gonna time travel to about 500 years ago, all right? So we're gonna go to about 500 years ago. I'm not gonna take it back further than that because we could spend all day on this. Seriously. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the big three spices that come from uh, come from the uh, Molokka Islands, which are called the Spice Islands. It's now Indonesia. All right. So what happened? How did we get the spices today? Well, what happened was um, the, in the 1400s, there was a sultan in Persia who said, I'm cutting you guys off from all your spices. So they cut Europe off from their ma major spice route. So there were no more spices allowed in Europe. Uh, they couldn't get them. So in the discovery years, uh, the big European powers started looking for a sea route to these mysterious Molokka Islands. Nobody knew where they were except for the people who went and got the spices. So we come along and you've got the three big guys that went looking for all these spices. That's uh, Columbus. He went the wrong way, right? We all know that. <laughs> he did. He went the wrong way. We have uh, Vasco de Gama. Uh, and he actually discovered a trade route, in the sea, uh, the sea route into India um, that avoided the Turks and avoided all the people that were going to like try to kill him. And then there was Magellan, who circumnavigated the entire world, but also is the one who is attributed to finding the Molokka Islands, which is where cloves and nutmeg are from. Cloves and nutmeg grew together on this little island, and the people who grew these, there's lots of mystery and legend around these islands and the spices. There is a legend of the guards of the clove and the nutmeg were a firebird. And in order to get the spices, you had to throw meat on the ground. And the birds would go and get the food. And then the nests would fall and then you could get the spices. That's seriously a legend. That's from like the ancient, that's from ancient, ancient times. Now these spices were known in the, in the, in the ancient world. They, they knew them in Egypt. They knew them in Rome. They knew them uh, in Greece, in ancient Greece. Um, but we're just really focusing on the modern, on the more modern world. Um, this is a map of the Spice Islands. So it's really hard to see, but it's, there's, it's an archipelago, or I can't say that word, archipelago? Ar okay. Archipelago. Archipelago, okay. So um, it's a whole group of islands, but 
these spices only grew in these in this in this in these couple of islands, and um, it was really really hard to get them. The Portuguese were the ones who found the islands. So the Portuguese ran the islands first. They ran them for about a hundred years. Uh, they were at war with the Dutch. So Holland came in and said, "No, I want the spices." And Holland came in and they got the spices. So. Um, for the next several hundred years, the Dutch ran the Spice Islands. Um, they traded the Spice Islands for the island of Manhattan in New York. There is this big, huge, bloody war between England and Holland. Uh, they were looking for the trade routes. There's a lot of pirating going on. You know, the pirates, they, were, they weren't necessarily really pirates. They were different countries fighting under a skull flag. It's true, um, and so they came down and they uh, they 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 swatted out the Portuguese and the and they came in and they ran it for several hundred years. But they they traded it out to the British, and the British got the islands, and then they also got India, and that's where you get the uh, East Indian uh, Trading Company from the British. So. So let's talk about these spices, okay? Um, we didn't talk about cinnamon. Cinnamon is from uh, Ceylon, Sri Lanka, down in the southern tip of India, right? So cinnamon has been used for many, 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 many centuries. It's been used by the ancient Egyptians, by the Romans, by the Greeks, by um, uh, the Europeans, by everybody. And, and cinnamon here, in the states now there's two kinds of cinnamon cinnamon is kind of tough people don't understand cinnamon there's true cinnamon ceylon cinnamon ceylon cinnamon is what actually went around europe but there's also cassia now cassia is from south asia actually it's from the south of china it's a cousin plant to to um uh to uh, Ceylon cinnamon, and I'm not going to try to pronounce the Latin words because I never learned Latin, so please don't fault me for that. <laughs> so, um, so the cinnamon is found when the Molokka Islands were, found, were, were, were conquered. We, we, we got to the cinnamon, we got to India, so, so um, we started trading spices out of India, so the British, the British have got all of this going. Um, so the thing about Ceylon cinnamon is it loses its flavor in the baking process, but it makes a better powder and extract. Cassia cinnamon is a, is a more pungent flavor when you bake with it. Very interesting. Um, there's some really, really awesome uh, uh, medicinal uses for cinnamon. It is antimicrobial. Um, it does inhibit the growth of bacteria and it does help with diabetes and insulin control. So if you've got some health issues with diabetes and with um, uh, microbes, go ahead and grab some cinnamon and start using that. Um, the tea, the, the, the Indian tea chai is spiced with cinnamon and black pepper and cloves and some of these spices we're talking about today. All right. So that's cinnamon. We all play on cinnamon. I got 30 minutes here, folks, so we're gonna we're gonna do this quick. I mean, I could talk about each one of these spices like an hour each. So um, so stay up with me. I will take questions afterwards. Um, nutmeg. All right. So nutmeg comes from the Malacca Islands. Nutmeg is actually two spices. It's nutmeg and it's mace. Not a lot of people understand this. Mace is that outside casing. So if you see a, a, an ingredient mace in some of your baking uh, recipes, it's this outside shell. And so when they process nutmeg, they have to crack the mace off of it, and then you get the little nut. All right? Now, the nut, we, we, we look at nutmeg as a nut, but it is really a seed of an, of an apple-like tree. So they have to like harvest this fruit, take the nutmeg out, and then take out the mace and then you have the little nutmeg. Nutmeg is much better used freshly grated. So you get a little microplane that you see here, right? And you grate it. 
buying pre-grated pre nutmeg is really, uh, you're losing a lot of flavor. Fresh nutmeg is always, always better flavor. Um, nutmeg was originally used in savory dishes by the Europeans, not in desserts. These spices we relegate to the dessert shelf and the, and the, and the baking shelf, but they, were, they, they are outstanding in savory dishes. You add a little nutmeg to like um, a potato soup or something like that, it just really brings that flavor out. Um, and it is part of the spice mixture that makes up pumpkin pie spice, right? So, and what's weird about that is pumpkin is actually a new world food, so it's from the Americas, and nutmeg is all the way from those weird little islands down there nobody knew about, and they marry really well together. Uh, some of its health and wellness benefits. Mm. It does have the antibacterial. It, it, it can be an anti-nausea medicine. It, the Chinese thinks it's an aphrodisiac. A lot of these have aphrodisiac properties. And you can use it to relieve toothaches. Isn't that fun? Yay! All right, clove. You all love cloves? Yeah, good flavor. Put them in the orange, mm, right? Make that aromatic smell in your, in your, I don't know, we used to put the, put the cloves in the orange and then set it in your drawer and then made it smell really nice. It's supposed to be really good for your clothing. I don't know. So again, it comes from, uh, it comes from the Moluccas and its original name was from the French, clau, which means nail. And if you look at a little clove, I don't have a, I can back it up, but if you look at it, if you look at an old world nail from like back in the day, it looked like a nail. And so the little flower head, the way it blooms out, and then they pick it right before it flowers, and then it's just that little top, little bobble on the top, and it looks like a nail, so they called it nail. I don't know what the original names were. I don't speak Latin. <laughs> so um, this is another spice that's used in cookies and cakes. and um, they were also used as perfume. So you can extract a clove oil and make it into perfume. Um, it's also used as a topical for medicinal res uh, remedies, and I, that's as far as I got. Um, so back in the day, in the, four, in, in the 13, 1400s, they had this thing called a pomodor. Am I saying that right? Yeah. So the pomodor, pomodor. The pomodor was a ball that they put um, different spices in and they would carry it around because you know we didn't used to have this really good smelling population <laughs> right so so they had to do something so like when the nobility would walk around into uh, walk around the common people they would carry these commanders that had sense of, and they wore a chain and it was on around their neck and you would smell it so that you wouldn't smell the smell of your environments because you know you had the butchers you had all the people that didn't walk, bathe every day and things like that <laughs> that's just the way it was right you know bathing is a new concept really <laughs> plumbing indoor plumbing um so um cloves are considered a warming spice these are all warming spices um and in the Molucca islands the, uh, the legend goes that for every child born, a clove tree was planted. Isn't that nice? For every child born. And it was thought that when the clove tree died, that was the end of the child's life. And that's sad. Because like, what if you don't live, what, what if the tree died when you were 20? And you, and you can live until 80. Anyway. And the first reference of cloves is from the second century BC in the Han Dynasty. That's a long time. So these people knew about these islands and they got these spices. And then, you know, the Europeans went and found out what they were. <coughs> so what do I use cloves for? I use cloves for a lot of savory stuff. Um, I use them in my suits. Uh, I make a watermelon gazpacho and um, I add a little clove in there and it just like pops a back flavor into it. It's really nice. Um, I put it in my spinach saute. Spinach and cloves play really well together. 
Um, it's used in it's uh, background flavor in barbecue sauces and in a lot of sodas. It's used in mulled wine and in apple cider. So cloves are used not just for baking and desserts. Yay! Who here knows about pepper? Oh, not very many. Good! Yay! All right, peppercorns. All right, peppercorns. Pepper, the pepper plant is actually from India. It's from the south of India. And peppercorns, uh, again, a really ancient spice, been used for thousands of centuries, thousands of years. Um, it is a very common table spice today. We, everybody has salt and pepper on their table, right? Well, salt and pepper both were once used as currency because getting them, obtaining them was a, a lot harder and cost a lot of money. So salt was used as currency for Roman soldiers. Pepper corns were used as currency throughout the trade routes, um, throughout the uh, spice road in different, in different um, countries and states. Um, so it's from southern India. So you see the different berries here, right? Green, white, black. It's all the same plant, all the same berry. Um, you, you see the four, four peppercorn melange on the in, in the in the grocery stores, right? Now, what's that pink thing doing in there? Does anybody know what that? Do you see a pink peppercorn up here? No, no, I don't either. Uh, pink peppercorns are actually a pepper plant from Peru. Yeah, so they make this four peppercorn melange with uh, one one peppercorn in different stages of, of ripening, and a, uh, and a and a peppercorn from Peru. So, and that's like the major chef melange. We like to use that for flavoring things. It's it's a really good that pink peppercorn has a really good flavor, but it's not a true pepper. Um, so what happens with peppercorns when they're um, cured? So the green is uh, the green is the um, unripe berry, and that's dried for just a little bit, and then it's cured so it stays green, right? And then um, then they dry it, uh, they soak it, and they dry it for a few more days, and then you get the black. And then the next stage is to get the white peppercorn is they take the they take that skin off. And so that's how you get the white peppercorn. And the white pepper is actually a more, has a deeper pepper flavor than the other stages. And I once worked for a chef who said, I hate white pepper. And why, ha, ha, I don't understand, chef, why do you hate white pepper? He didn't like white pepper. Don't put white pepper in anything. Oh, okay. And I worked for other chefs who said, hey, put white pepper in everything. And don't put black pepper in your potatoes, put white pepper in them because they didn't want to color the potato. So, because if you use black pepper in, a, in, in, in your mashed potatoes, it, it, it turns it, you, you get those little black flecks. Some chefs don't like that. So I personally, I love white pepper. I use it a lot. It's got a really strong flavor. Always buy your spices fresh and grind them at home. How do you grind your spices? Go buy a coffee grinder from Goodwill, right? Use that, grind your spices, or you can use a blender. So when I was working, uh, at the high-end restaurant, we would take our Vitamix. Everybody else uses Vitamix for raw food. I use it for spices. <laughs> take a whole bag of black pepper, dump it in there, puree it, and then it'll grind it up, and then you can um, then you can use it. Now I grind as needed, so I only grind a little bit at a time, or I uh, buy the peppers in the thing and grind them that way. And you can. Pepper grinders are really expensive. The good ones, the stainless steel ones. Um, so what's pepper used for medicinally? Medicinally, it is to treat digestive disorders. So it's a car, 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 ah, that's another word, carminative. So it helps to spell gas. It's really good for your indigestion system, for your digestion system. It's really good for indigestion. It's really good, uh, they say it's good for respiratory diseases. So like if you have some respiratory problems, you can ingest some pepper. And well, you know, in a mix, like you know, find a good mix, and then um, uh, it's used to treat. It was used to treat ulcers, and I don't know quite. I'm not quite sure how yet, but um, so yeah. So we cover all that. So any questions on pepper? Nope. All right.
Cool. Anybody know about saffron? Huh? No questions? No? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, so. All right, saffron, one of the oldest spices as well in the world. Saffron's been in use for over 3,500 3, years. That's a long time. Um, it was first, possibly first culminated in ancient Greece. They say it's from ancient Persia. And that whole Mediterranean area, spices kind of traveled around and did their thing. Um, so saffron traveled throughout the world, uh, throughout the Mediterranean, and it made its way into Asia and China and India, and, um, and so, so it became one of the major uh, um, ingredients they used to dye the monks' robes in India, so the Buddhist monks something like 80, 70 to 75 percent of the saffron harvest goes to dye robes. Why is saffron so expensive? You know, you, you look at it, you see it's like 20, you know, $25 an ounce. Break that down. That's expensive, right? I can get some here for about $20 an ounce. Um, but it's because it takes so few threads to flavor something or color something. So, you know, an ounce doesn't look like an ounce. That's probably an ounce right there. But you use like four or five of those threads in rice and you get this nice yellow color with that flavor that it has. It's beautiful. Um, the, reason, the other reason it's so expensive is it has to be hand harvested. So the way the crocus flower opens up and you've got the stigmas in there, you have to pick out each one of those stigmas by hand and you get like I think it's four or five stigmas per flower and it takes 70,000 flowers to make a pound of saffron. <laughs> yeah, see, so <laughs> we use these spices every day but we really don't understand what, uh, where they come from or what it, what it takes to get them to your table and that's, that's really amazing. Um, yeah, and they can't be machine harvested, it's too delicate. So, so you have all these fields of saffron in India where people are harvesting and, and, and plucking. And that's a job I want, you just sit there plucking little stigmas out. I don't know. <laughs> um, this is also one of the most highly adulterated spices over the centuries. You guys all know what adulteration means? Okay, so we're going to put something else into this to make it so that so that it costs less for me as the producer but more for you so they'll use saff safflower because safflower threads safflower stigmas look almost like saffron but a keen eye can tell if something's adulterated because it's not as orange it's got a little bit of a duller flavor or a duller color so if you look at it you can see because I, I bought saffron thre or safflower threads and saffron thre threads and you look at them and it's like, yeah, there's a definite difference, a definite difference in price. But um, all of these spices over the centuries, people would add different things. They would add like, like um, sawdust to uh, to coffee or to the teas or to some of these other spices we were talking about. Yeah, you know, this was four or five hundred years ago because it cost it cost so much to get it to you, but. It doesn't cost me anything to put a filler in there, right? And the sawdust was really common, so I didn't do it. How are we doing on time? Okay. Two or three. Okay, so good. I did good. All right. So, um, so I guess uh, how to how to flavor a dish with just a few ingredients. Um, so, like I said, spinach saute, right? I take spinach. Um, some vegan butter, uh, a little bit of salt, and a little bit of clove, and I saute that. And that gives you a really, oh, garlic, did I say garlic? And garlic, chopped garlic. And that gives you a really flavorful side dish for your, um, to serve at your table. 
You can uh, mash potatoes, a little soy milk, a little vegan butter, uh, salt, and white pepper, and some roasted garlic. Boom, done. Table pepper, everybody's got pepper on their table. Um, I told you I put a little bit of clove into my uh, watermelon gazpacho. That's got, it's got watermelon, uh, agave, uh, habanero, mint, and then a little bit of clove. So just like five ingredients or less and you can have a really super flavorful dish. And um, thank you for being here. Let me tell you all about me because I'm done with my talk. Did you guys enjoy it? Yeah? All right, cool. Did you learn stuff? Yeah? All right, cool. So um, I have a soup cookbook. Uh, it ranges from the really easy to kind of hard. Um, it's on uh, Amazon Kindle. Uh, you can go to our website and order it from there, or you can go straight to Kindle. I'm on Facebook, Google+, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, all across, uh, all across the board. Like me on social media. Outside, we've got some information set up and a sign-up list if you want to sign up. If you want to get my newsletter, you can. Um, I have, uh, you can, if you have a QR code. the QR code, you can scan it right on your phone and get my newsletter right away, or you can sign up and we can add you into our newsletter. Um, thank you so much for attending. I appreciate it, and I hope to see you again.